actually we're looking to the east, we're looking to the west, we're looking globally today. I love this kind of show. This is a multi, <laughs> this is a, I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech, and we are joined by Steve Zercher, who's a regular host at this time on Mondays, um, and uh, a, a, a colleague of his, uh, and, oh, by the way, Steve is in, in Japan, in Kobe, Japan, and a <clears> colleague <throat> of his is uh, Paul Scott, who is uh, in Paris, France, in, in Lille, France. Did I get that right? Paris. Paris, Paris, but Lille is all the same. Um, it's, all, it's all 12 hours difference. So what we have is, what, roughly, what, four or five hours difference uh, tomorrow uh, in Kobe, and then we have 12 hours difference um, tomorrow tomorrow yeah. <laughs> in France. Right. And um, I, guess the, I guess the first thing I want to say is thank you, Paul, for staying up late. Because if you do the math, um, it's one o'clock in the morning in, in, in France, in Paris. Thank you for joining us at this ridiculous hour. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, Steve, can you, can you introduce Paul in a oh, better way than I did? It's, it's, no, it's my great, great pleasure. Paul and I, uh, as uh, our viewers know, I'm a professor and dean at Kansai Gaidai University, which is in Osaka, Japan. And when I joined that institution, roughly, Paul, it was 10 years ago now. It's hard to believe, but 10 years ago I joined. Uh, Paul became my de facto mentor and helped me to understand uh, not only academia, but also the inner workings of Kansai Gaidai and how that all works. And uh, without his assistance and guidance, I, I don't think I would have become dean. So I have a great sense of uh, uh, appreciation of what uh, Paul did for me when I started my new career, my mid-career uh, move into academia. Um, so Paul ret retired a few years ago. So he's a professor emeritus now from Kansai Gaida University. And uh, as noted, he's an expatriate living in Paris, France. So um, his education includes University of Virginia and also Tokyo University, which is the number one university in Japan. He taught at Kansai Gaidai for about uh, 30 plus years. Uh, and was a very successful professor and leader in the organization. So I was thinking as we were getting closer to the election, uh, Jay, you and I share the, the view of how Japan and China and Korea uh, is thinking about what's going on in the United States because believe me, everybody, everybody in the world is paying attention to this election. Um, so I thought it'd be a good idea to invite Paul because Paul now has been living in Paris and absorbing the European perspective. So uh, that's how this all came about. And also I, I want to offer my thanks as well, appreciation to Paul for uh, drinking less of coffee tonight to stay up at one o'clock in the morning. You know, I offered to do this as a recording, but Paul volunteered to do it live, which I think is best. If there's any viewers who have questions, uh, please let us know. How much of what uh, Steve said do you agree with? Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with everything he said. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Jay, thanks for checking, Jay. <laughs> Just doing my fact checking. <laughs> well, let's start off with you, Paul. I mean, you're in Paris, um, and Paris follows what happens in the U.S. very closely. I imagine you get all the channels we get, um, and you probably get them with French over, overdubbed on it or something, but you get all the news we get, and, and people must have specific views. You must have specific views about how things are going. Um, what, what are those views? Well, that's, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, question, of course. The, uh, the, the name of this uh, show is, is, is Europe and how Europe looks at the election. And the problem is which Europe? And uh, when, um, when we're looking at uh, France and especially Germany, uh, they, um, they definitely, absolutely, fundamentally, uh, do not like uh, the uh, the presidency of, of Mr. Trump um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, some of them are legitimate and some of them are not legitimate, um, I think, in my eyes. Um, um, uh, but when we look at another part of Europe, which um, would be Central and Eastern Europe, uh, if there still is uh, a central and eastern Europe, you know, all Europe is uh, Europe is under the European Union. But uh, Poland loves, I don't want to say, well, maybe not loves, but they uh, appreciate Mr. Trump. Um, they uh, certainly strongly um, uh, encourage NATO expansion. Uh, they were going to name a uh, an American camp in Poland, Camp Trump, 
uh, but that uh, that hasn't uh, taken part. So <laughs> Europe, of course, um, Europe um, was like I think the rest of the world. Um, they were shocked uh, by the Trump uh, win in 2016, and they're they're waiting. Uh, I think they thought they could wait out a, uh, until they get a good president. Uh, but that, I think, is also very wishful thinking on their part. And it's not an anti-Biden um, comment on my part. It's, um, it's exactly what uh, Jay said, uh, uh, you know, before we, uh, we, before we started to, uh, uh, to record this, is that the world is changing. So the old transatlantic uh, alliance um, uh, from the Cold War and then to the Clinton administration where the US was the indispensable power uh, to, uh, to the Bush years um, uh, and now and the Obama doctrine, which is sort of Bush light, um, that world doesn't, um, is, um, has changed. Um, America is no longer the indispensable power. Um, and uh, the Europeans, um, and I, if there was a European in the room, I would say this to them bluntly, the Europeans have to grow up. Um, and um, they, uh, they uh, talk about autonomy, uh, but they're still over, overly reliant on the United States. And um, so Mr. Trump has hit a lot of, a lot of hot buttons asking the Europeans <laughs> to pay more for defense, uh, 2%. And um, uh, the Americans also don't like um, a pipeline that is going from Russia uh, through the Baltics. And, uh, and that's not Trump, that's the US Congress as well. And Mr. Biden agrees with this as well. So I think um, Europe is, you know, if you do risk analysis or if you do uh, any type of uh, uh, financial analysis, what people hate more than anything else is uncertainty. So there's still uncertainty with uh, if Mr. Biden wins, um, we don't know. And uh, so we're getting ner nervousness in Europe, uh, whether Trump will have another, no another four years or even when Biden is elected, um, just people don't know, um, except that things have fundamentally changed um, because of Trump, in spite of Trump, um, these things were changing and I think we didn't fully appreciate it. It's a multipolar world. Um, it's, no, it's, not, it's not bipolar, it's not unipolar. And all of us, the three of us have witnessed America as the indispensable power, as a unipower. Um, and uh, it's a different world. Um, so, yeah, well, and when you, uh, when you uh, take off mm, COVID, and just look at the way uh, the EU and Europe have operated it. It's a profound change. And um, when you put COVID on and then you, you, you seal the borders and you stop travel, you stop tourism between the US and, and Europe, it just seems to me there must be a sense of distancing, a sense of uh, disconnection between the average European country and citizen and, and the US. We're not there anymore. We're not, we're not the tourists. We don't have a presence. And all Trump does is beat people up. Uh, so what you get is a whole different relationship. Do you Absolutely. feel that in the past few years, people in Europe are, mm, let, they, they, they like the US less. They are not enamored with the US as they were. They don't like Mr. Trump. Uh, American uh, people, American culture, um, is still uh, is still strong. You know they uh, they dislike the international treaties and the agreements that Mr. Trump has uh, rejected. Uh, they don't like that, but they're smart enough to uh, well to know number one. You know you don't. Uh, you know the U.S. still has a twenty one trillion dollar economy, um, and um, uh, it's. Um, uh, and that uh, the American uh, people uh, uh, are looked at uh, in a very kind way. You know, when I was in Europe, when when uh, when uh, President Obama was uh, was elected, and uh, people were um, I don't know how they knew I was an American, but they were uh, they were uh, they were shouting at me and sort of raising their fists and say yes, 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 yes. 
And uh, they were, and I said to my some of my friends' friends, you know, do you think someone from North Africa or West Africa, uh, an immigrant or migrant, would ever be elected president of France? Um, and they said, uh, oh, of course not. Of course, this is wonderful. This is wonderful. And you know, I was doing a lot of traveling during the during the the Bush years, and people were not happy with America during the Bush years um at all and i never like to and i don't want to apologize for uh, for my country um so i never like to be put in that position and i don't want to do it publicly um other people can but i it's i it's not my i don't like to do it um, one last one last question about that before we go to find out what's on steve's mind is this um do people feel that trump fairly represents America now. After all, people voted for him. He is the product of the process by which we select our leaders. He represents the country. Do they feel um, you know, that the, the country is behind Trump, that Trump is a, 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 a statement of the, the leader of this country? Well, you know, when we look at the rise of right-wing parties throughout Europe, uh, in Germany, in France, in Britain, and uh, right-wing populism, right-wing populist nationalism, um, uh, that Europeans understand um, polarization and that they understand that Trump is uh, appealing um, to many segments of society, you know, 5 million manufacturing jobs were lost in the United States uh, between 2000 and uh, 2016. Um, and both political parties uh, ignored those people. Um, and this is a failure of, if, if you let me talk just for another minute, this is a really, really, really failure of, of political parties, the traditional ones. And, um, uh, not, and in the United States, in France, we have a president, there's a president in France, that started his own political party and won. And um, we have the uh, ultra right in Germany that is now uh, the uh, alternative for Germany or the alternative, what, what are they called, AFD? Um, uh, that the uh, German uh, populist right wing uh, neo-Nazi party, if you like, is, uh, is Germany's largest um, uh, opposition party. So to answer your question, I'm sorry, People understand that um, that Trump uh, is a symptom, yeah. and uh, I think that's really critical. That uh, um, he didn't come out of uh, uh, people are focusing too much, and the media loves him here. He's on every. You're completely right. Uh, he's on uh, all the major stu uh, studio uh, television stations. Trump is big business. Yeah. Um, uh, so they understand that. Uh, uh, so I think the analysis here in Europe is is much more nuanced than in the United States, where they looked at, uh, where, they looked at the, uh, where they look at the causes of Trump, uh, not just the personality and not just his rhetoric, and it, all that is sort of noise. Um, it's important noise, but uh, it's noise. So there's that distinction between Trump. Uh, and some of his policies. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Steve, this is my favorite question. Steve, how, how much of what Paul said do you agree with? I mean, what's I, the comparison? I, uh, I think there's some differences, but I agree with Paul's conclusion. And that's my conclusion as well, if I can jump ahead here to my, to my ending note. I also think that over the last four years, um, that the damage has been done. And uh, much of it can be traced to Trump and his policies and how he's addressed Asia and uh, taken the United States out of uh, a lead role in, in many areas where the United States traditionally had been a leader. Um, and that no matter who wins this election going forward, um, Asia will respond to America in a much different way than it would have done under a different president in 2016. So I do agree with that for sure. But uh, let me 
uh, go to my beginning notes, I just want to go back to the original days when, when Trump was elected. The response that I picked up when I was in Japan uh, was one of um, a little bit of derision. So I was at uh, Chamber of Commerce events. I was the ACCJ vice president of Econsai. So I had to go to all these formal events. And I was surprised, uh, kind of in the same way that Paul was talking about, uh, this, this feeling of not wanting to apologize for your country. <clears throat> I certainly understand the, the negative aspects of the, the many mistakes that our country has made over the years. But I'm, I'm, I guess still, because I'm an American, I, I feel a sense of patriotism. And I was a little bit surprised at the jokes that I heard over and over again. That was in the beginning. That's in 2016, 2017. I think now uh, Japan in particular and the rest of Asia is frankly worried. Uh, they're, they're really concerned because uh, the last few years have uh, been, there's been at best an absence of leadership and where there has been a, an effort to try and change things like in the case of North Korea, which I think everybody will admit what, what Trump did there was a total failure. Right, so that, that affects Japan, that certainly affects South Korea, that affects China. So there's a sense of, of deep concern about this. Regarding um, the prospects of the election, uh, I think a lot of this, at least for us, and I, Paul kind of alluded to this, that it, it's no longer a unipolar polar world. You know, China is the 800 pound gorilla in Asia. I think the United States still has effective, uh, inter effective influence in, in the region, but China, has dramatically improved their position economically and also militarily in Asia, in part because Trump has, has withdrawn. You know, like, for example, the TPP, he, he withdrew from that like on day one. So all of a sudden, that uh, international collaboration to try and contain the economic growth of China, make them more reasonable and play by the rules, uh, Trump unilaterally just withdrew from. So uh, there's a great concern about that. So Japan, because China is its number one economic partner, as true for most Asian countries. China is the number one economic partner now. The United States was, has gone off the number one list a long time ago. So from an economic perspective, Japan has to focus on that. Japanese businesses, for example, need to be aware of the relationship with China and so forth. But on the other side, you know, the United States is in in some ways trying to break the relationship between Japan and China that may continue or may not continue under different administrations after this upcoming election. But that indeed uh, is how the election is viewed. It's through that screen, through that color. How will Biden affect the China-US relationship? How will Trump affect the China-US relationship? It's really, I, sometimes when I talk with my colleagues, they don't want to admit how important China is now, but China is really important. And I think Paul would agree with me in Africa and Europe and the rest of the world, China also has a much stronger influence. So then just in conclusion, um, as I mentioned before, uh, I think that no matter who wins this election, uh, by the way, you know, uh, 538 and The Economist, they're all putting Biden at 80 8%, 89%, 91% to win. But people in Asia, they just, they're not aware of that. They really think that Trump is probably going to win. And this is a legacy of the 2016 election, when at that point, everybody thought Clinton was going to win. I mean, everybody in Japan thought Clinton was going to win. Everybody knew Clinton. They were convinced. And then on that election day, Trump won. So even though the numbers are showing that he will not win, the perception is in Asia is that he still might. He still may. And if he does win, I don't think anybody will be surprised. Mm. <clears throat> well, that may be the case. <clears throat> we have a question from a viewer, you guys, and I, I'd like to ask you both this question and, and ask you to weigh in on it. The viewer uh, asks, uh, are the East and the West updated with all the issues in America? For example, Black Lives Matter, uh, the immigration issues, and so many others. Um, or, or does the East and the West, both you know, Europe and, and Japan and uh, other parts of Asia, do they just focus on the excitement, the drama of this election process that we're, you know, we're, we're faced with every day? Um, so, so query, how, you know, you said before, uh, Paul, that it was, they, they had a nuanced view in Europe of what was happening in the U.S., but do they understand all our domestic issues and our questions of morality and uh, the rule of law and all those things that people are in controversy about? 
Well, that's a great question because it's it's not just uh, it's it's not just the um, we can say the popular view. Um, it's also the elite view, and uh, you know uh, Stephen and I are both in the business of of making sure that our students become good Japanologists or sinologists, um, um, and that uh, you know people can look at um, at uh, a country. Uh, different than theirs, and um, and uh, and go to the heart of matters, and not to be distracted is sort of what I call an entry point. And for the U.S., there's so many entry points. So I think that Europe fundamentally understands the crisis of migration because they're in a crisis of migration as well, uh, north, uh, uh, south to north, and. This drives uh, right-wing populism. And I, um, uh, so migration is, is a hot topic throughout Europe. Um, the, um, the president of France just a couple of days ago um, said that uh, there is not, not going to be any separatism in France. In other words, you, become, uh, you, you come to France and immigrate, um, you become French. And that is a, um, that, uh, imagine me saying that on a crowded street corner in the United States. Um, um, I'd have to have police protection if there were police. Um, racism, um, of course, uh, racism, the U.S. is, the U.S. looks at things mainly from a, a race angle in Europe, uh, more from a class angle, uh, but, Everyone in France, for example, understands that if you have a name from North Africa or West Africa, uh, that your application is not going to go to the top. Uh, it's, um, so, but um, but um, you, uh, it's not that it's not as emotional in the United States. And uh, I teach, you know, I teach. It's awful to say this. Stephen and I teach students that were born in two thousand two. 18 years old. Um, so um, uh, they, um, they uh, you know, my, my point is that uh, the emotion in America, I think, uh, and the violence, and where the camera lens goes as well, you know, um, is, uh, is, is shocking. We don't see that in France. Uh, we don't, we see protests in Germany, um, right wing protests. Um, and I have one more point is the left in Europe generally has not developed an effective counter narrative to the right. And uh, Mr. Biden, by the way, is not, uh, is not a, a counter narrative, except I'm not Trump. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, so my feeling is the real election in the United States will be 2024. Um, uh, where the Democratic Party will have to uh, um, do things, um, uh, perhaps choose a more progressive, and the Republicans will have to go up. So that that um, that um, discussion is happening in Europe because there are elections happening in France in two years, um, and um, so those same issues that are making America seem so chaotic. Um, it's not chaotic. These are things that have been um, have been left on the on the stove, uh, bubbling for a long time. And uh, mm. uh, the Europeans understand this. Mm. The Americans should understand it a little bit more. Yes, I agree certainly. So, Steve, what about Asia? What about Japan? Yeah, well, I, I can speak for Japan. I was I was shocked that in Tokyo and Osaka there were Black Lives Matter protests. Mm, interesting. Yeah, uh, mostly young people, but not necessarily all young people. You know, there's uh, inequities in this country. I, I think most people view Japan as homogeneous. Japanese people certainly view Japan as homogeneous, but it's about 2% foreigners here now. And there are uh, multi-generational Koreans that have been here that are still not full citizens. So that spirit of 
minorities being overlooked and taken advantage of and being economically disadvantaged did transfer over to Japan. You know, Japan tends not to be a country where protests are, are seen that often. The only ones I remember are, are against the Iraq war. The Japanese people certainly understood that that was a disaster. The leadership, of course, did not, Koizumi, but the people did. They were in front of my apartment every day protesting. So on the Black Lives Matter, BLM, yes, Japanese people are aware of that and they understand the social inequity that occurs in the United States and has been traditional, as Paul was talking about. But they also recognize that that's a problem here. We also have income inequality in Japan, which is almost not quite at the levels of the United States. So there are a lot of people who are doing well, and more and more people are being pushed into poverty in Japan. So that sense of frustration and un unfairness, unequalness, was captured by Black Lives Matters, and it actually resulted in protests. But uh, just very quickly, the biggest thing that's not election related that the Japanese people are focusing on, and this is a part of the reason why Japanese, uh, uh, the United States reputation has gone down so dramatically in Asia, is how the pandemic has been handled. So mm -hmm. I was, we were talking before the show started, uh, Japan's at approximately 90, maybe it's about maybe 95,000 infections now. It's going up by maybe 200 a day. But a few days ago in America, it was 60,000 in one day. So Japanese people look at America and they cannot understand how the richest, you know, the, the number one economy, the number one military could just so totally fail at protecting its people from this pandemic while the rest of Asia, for the most part, has done a superb job. China is... China's bouncing back now economically. Jay, I don't know if you've noticed, but flights are now at 100%. The economy is going to start growing again. It's, it's miraculous. That's where this pandemic started. But they managed it in a completely different way, an authoritarian way, granted, that was probably not possible in Japan or other countries. But still, you know, it's all guns blazing now for China, and the United States mm -hmm. is still in a mess. So Japanese people look at that and they go, what the hell is going on with America? You know, part of it's related to Trump, but it's, it's looking at the country as a whole. How could yeah. the whole country fail so badly? That the Japanese people are very aware of. That's and a problem. I could, uh, interject <laughs> with the National Endowment for Democracy uh, uh, came out with a report just a couple of days ago talking about uh, how COVID has strengthened authoritarians. Um, and, you know, who's, who's doing really well in Europe? Hungary, for example, Poland. Um, so, um, people, people can't, when they look at America, they say, oh my goodness, even public health becomes, uh, becomes po uh, political polarization, you know, wear a mask, um, you know, confinement is another issue, whether it works or doesn't work, but, uh, you know, wear a mask. Yeah. Um, and, um, so the, I agree with, um, uh, Stephen completely, this lack of, lack of leadership or lack of, um, a lack of, a, a coherent strategy, um, uh, is, um, you know, if you want leaders, you have to have followers and, um, COVID, uh, for Europe is my goodness, what are we following? Uh, the Trump administration seems incompetent. Yeah. Uh, at this and by the way the Boris Johnson administration seems incom incompetent as well I want to wrap up this show I want to thank Paul Scott from Paris again for staying up late in the evening and providing his commentary on how Europe is viewing this election Paul that was really in interesting insights uh, uh, fascinating for me to see where Europe's perspective and Asia's perspective uh, is similar and also where it diverge uh, diverges as well so thank you so much for being on the show. And we definitely want to have you back again, uh, maybe after the election is over, so we can get a post-election view from Europe as well. OK, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk thank to you. you. And uh, I hope, hope to be back soon. Thank you. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thanks for the question that came in, too. We appreciate that. Yes. We'll see you in a couple of weeks on Looking to the East.